Hello, and thank you so much for joining us for a special ISACA and IIA live conversation featuring one of our keynote speakers at the upcoming GRC conference in Austin, Texas. I'm Paul Phillips, the Director of Event Content Development, and I'm joined by Tanisha Landry, the Director of Programming with the IIA, and cybersecurity expert Rachel Wilson. Rachel is the first ever head of cybersecurity for Morgan Stanley Wealth Management. She was recognized as part of the company's 2019 Makers Class, a program honoring female groundbreakers, innovators, and advocates, and was named one of the top women in Wealth Tech 2020 by Think Advisor. Prior to joining Morgan Stanley, Rachel ha held several key executive level positions in the National Security Agency. She is recognized as a thought leader on protecting children and teenagers from cyber threats as she advises individuals and organizations on cybersecurity best practices and strategies. For those of us joining us today, before we get started with the interview, please tell us where you're from in the comments and add any questions you have in there as well. We'll do our best to answer those questions for you today. So let's get started. Tanisha, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Paul, for that. And uh, Rachel, I'm so excited to uh, to speak to you today and to see you in Austin for the GRC conference. So here's the thing. You, Rachel, you spent the last 15 years at the National Security Agency running counterterrorism operations You've worked against cybersecurity threats at the 2012 Summer Olympics in London and spent five years leading NSA's cyber exploitation operations mission. So if you can imagine today, we've got so many questions, right? But the first piece in drawing across all of your experience in preparing to help prepare governance risk and compliance professionals to target and mitigate threats, the first point question we have today is, what do you really hope those attending the GRC Conference 2024 will learn from your cybersecurity session? Well, Tanisha, thank you so much for having me today. And I, too, am so looking forward to GRC in Austin. We have so much to talk about, and I think our time together in our session really is going to be a lot of fun. So, as you mentioned, I'm Rachel Wilson. I run cybersecurity for Morgan Stanley Wealth Management. In a nutshell, that means that I and my team are responsible for making sure that every system, every network, every application that we field to our employees around the country and to our clients around the world, that all of those systems are as time-tested, battle-hardened, hacker-proofed as possible before we field them out there in the world. And for all of your attendees this year at GRC, we've got a lot of ground to cover. So in my session, which I will admit I am super excited for, we are going to be taking a world tour of the cybersecurity risk landscape. I'm going to give all of you a deep dive into my source of sleepless nights over these last seven years. I don't sleep well. And Tanisha, if we do everything right in, Aud in Austin, your audience will not be sleeping well either. We will be collective cyber insomniacs together. 25 years in the cybersecurity business, I have never seen the threat landscape as acute as it is now. Between nation state cyber actors, cyber criminals, baddies, fraudsters sitting in their aunt's basement conducting cyber attacks. Yep. All of this means that all of us in the risk and compliance and audit space need to be highly attuned to these risks. So we're going to talk about all these risks and threats. We're going to talk about pragmatic steps we can all be taking to reduce our risk. And we're going to have a little bit of fun all at the same time. Oh, my gosh. From sleepless nights to fun and becoming cybersecurity insomniacs, that is so, it sounds like a thriller or a spy movie. So that just, the first thing that comes to mind from you saying that is um, cybersecurity does feel like a spy thriller, right? So if all of the things that you've done over your career were like a novel, 
what would be the plot twist that kept readers on their edge of their seats? Well, I mean, Tanisha, it is so true. We are, all of us in the cybersecurity space, we are playing a cat and mouse game. So when I look back at my career, you know, the years that I spent fighting terrorists um, definitely took a couple years off my life. You know, for the ladies watching today, this is when I started coloring my hair. We all know those highly stressful jobs that we find ourselves in. A couple of years in London, helping the British get ready for the 2012 Summer Olympics, all kinds of cyber threats there. Of course, when we're all together in Austin, we will be in the throes of this year's Summer Olympics. So I am super excited for those. But as all of you can imagine, when the Olympics rolls around, all the eyes of the world turn to that city, that country. That includes the eyes of terrorists, and it absolutely includes the eyes of hackers. So when I go back to 2012, we had the Chinese trying to hack into the clocks and timers at the Olympic venues. We had the Russians trying to get into the databases that housed the Olympic drug testing records which of course makes perfect sense now, made no sense to us at the time. All kinds of miscreants looking to rub grit in the eyes of the British. Then returning home, spending five years on the offense, hacking into the networks of our adversaries, stealing their secrets, giving them to our policymakers, our warfighters, all trying to keep our allies safe. But the big plot twist for me 15 years in government, decided to try my hand at something new, come to the private sector. I had never worked in finance. Many of the folks in our audience in Austin have been in financial services for many years. You know this space. I showed up here knowing nothing about what banks do, what financial services firms do. Um, I will tell you, Tanisha, between us, I thought we in government had cornered the market on bureaucracy. Then I came to a large bank only to discover that bureaucracy is alive and well in many, many parts of industry. So Wes, lots of ground we're going to cover in Austin. But for me, the twists and turns just continue. These last two years, especially with the rise in artificial intelligence, none of us could have anticipated just how much we were going to have on our plates. Mm, that is true. That is really, really intriguing, especially we talked about big, large stages between the Olympics and the large banks and the governments. When you, when some of our audience are coming from organizations that are a little bit smaller and may have a smaller budgets, so how do you take what you've gained from the large institutions that you've worked with and really kind of distill that down to two or three things that could be implemented on a smaller scale with a smaller budget to have an effective strategy? Well, Tanisha, it's a point that I make to folks all the time, that at the end of the day, so much of an effective cybersecurity strategy is table stakes, right? It is brass tacks. It's what I call cyber hygiene. This is the stuff that's not sexy, right? This is the brushing your teeth and eating your Wheaties of cybersecurity. It's the things that we know we need to do, but all too often get overlooked, even though they are basically free and we all know we need to do them. So for example, keeping all of our systems fully packed. This is our phones, our laptops, our desktops, making sure whether we're Microsoft, Google, whatever we're using, Windows, having that system, our phone updated, our laptop, our tablet, as soon as that software update is released, we want to go ahead and update our devices. This is crucially important for us personally and absolutely something that we should view as mandatory in our corporate capacities. I say this, because when that software update, that patch is released, again, utterly free to us, we enter into a race condition with the hackers. For us, that patch is the solution to the security vulnerability we didn't even know we had. All software manufacturers 
are constantly discovering new flaws, new bugs, new vulnerabilities in their code. They're fixing those vulnerabilities and they're issuing to us as consumers the fix in the form of that patch, that software update. For us, again, that patch is the solution to the vulnerability we didn't even know we had. But for the hackers, that patch is an opportunity. The Mm -hmm. hacker is going to reverse engineer that patch discover the underlying vulnerabilities that it mitigates and weaponize those vulnerabilities against those of us who have not yet patched. That means the onus is on us, whether we are in risk, governance, IT audit, or otherwise, to be insisting that our organizations are patching employee devices quickly because that patch, when it is collectively, comprehensively, and timely implemented basically immunizes us against those vulnerabilities so they can't be used against us. It's free. It's easy. We just need to have the conviction as an organization to do it. So that's really good. That's really sound advice. And it helps for both the professionals that are administering these patches and other security protocols, as well as the others of us who aren't the security professionals and need to understand the importance of why those patches and security fixes make sense. So thank you so much for really kind of diving in there. Um, When now there's new technology emerging trends, let's talk a little bit about AI. How do you see AI transforming the field of cybersecurity and what kind of benefits and risks Well, it's such a good point because you're exactly right, Tanisha, that there are huge risks presented around AI, and these really are applicable in many spaces. I mean, in my role, I'm responsible for data governance and data security, data privacy, data usage, and I worry about AI in all of those places, how we're using our data, how we're honoring privacy legislation, privacy regulations. Are we leveraging our data that our clients and customers entrust to us in ways that are compliant and appropriate? Are we applying those customer and client first consumer principles in everything we do? But when I think about AI from a cybersecurity perspective, if you went back in time five years ago, the vast majority of quote unquote offensive cyber activity that you would have seen in the landscape was nation states. So it would have been Rachel and her NSA capacity. It would have been the British, the Israelis, the Chinese, the Russians, all of these nation states hacking each other to conduct espionage, to steal steal secrets, all of the things that we would expect. Now, of course, all of that nation state hacking is still going on at scale. And frankly, it's going on at a scale that's larger than ever before. But the point that this audience needs to understand is that the real growth we've seen over the last five years have been in what we now call cyber criminal syndicate activity. This is cyber activity that is opportunistic. It's egalitarian. 70 percent of the malicious cyber activity we now see on the Internet is criminal in nature and is financially motivated. And this is where artificial intelligence has been such a boom. Now, with the introduction, proliferation, and availability of artificial intelligence technologies, and with the democratization of very advanced cyber toolkits, we've seen a lowering of the barrier to entry to being a cyber actor. Historically, you needed an advanced degree in computer science. You needed exposure to a nation state toolkit. You needed advanced training. Now, what do you need? You need some chat GPT, a little bit of open AI, maybe some exposure to some of this machine learning and AI. You need access to YouTube. And in a matter of days, you are off to the races, lowering that barrier to entry and increasing the scope, scale, velocity of cyber attacks to a level that is absolutely unprecedented. Very interesting. That is so very interesting. What is, in, in hearing this, what is one thing that 
that professionals can start to do to en- enhance their defensibility around a simple risk like a large language model or a chat chat function. So it is such a good point. And what we're finding more and more is that the solution to defending against artificial intelligence is, maybe no surprise, leveraging artificial intelligence. So if I can better understand how cyber actors are using AI to target firms like mine, clients like mine, I can then use that back against them. And the best cybersecurity technologies that we're seeing, the best vendor products, all the things on the market today are leveraging AI as a means of detecting and defending against AI. And we really think that's going to be the secret sauce moving forward. And that's good. I like the opportunity to kind of leverage to make sure that you're to, to build defensibility. So, Rachel, you've a wealth of knowledge. You've had a great deal of experience. What is, how do you stay ahead? And most importantly, how have you started to sleep at night? Well, I will admit I am still not sleeping well. You know, you look at just the last two years, the whole situation between Russia and Ukraine, which of course has been so sad, everything we've seen in the Middle East. I mean, the world is a scary place. And with the rise of these cyber criminal syndicates, all of us have to stay on our guard. I often tell our board of directors that the best we can hope for is that we're staying one or two steps ahead. And so in terms of staying ahead, I really think there are a couple of very intrinsic components. And what's interesting is that, of course, our time together in Austin is really a key component of this. We only get better by continually educating ourselves, generating more awareness, and collaborating across our industries to share best practices, to share experiences. This is a huge part of my job. I have my ear to the ground 24-7. What are my peers experiencing? What are others seeing in the landscape? Collaborating with government agencies, with private industry, all of these entities, we've got to work together in this space because if we're not collaborating, we're not going to win against the bad guys. You think about the big banks, Tanisha, like we're competing on so many fronts, but when it comes to cybersecurity, we are all actively collaborating. We're talking to each other every day in open industry forums. This is not a place for secrets, right? This is a place where we need every advantage we can get. No, that's definitely key. A very, very helpful. So appreciate that. Wow. So I'm thinking, I'm looking to see if we have any questions in the chat or if there were any comments that were submitted. I really love to see that we've got an international audience paying attention to us today. Um, so I'm really excited that again you're coming to join us at GRC in August. You've um plugged this so well. Really excited about that. All right. So we kind of touched on this a little bit, but are there two or three things that you would say you can implement it Well, smaller organizations can implement to have an effective strategy? So one of the most, and, and again, this is going to sound basic, Tanisha, but I got to tell you, it is it is the bane of my existence. We see so many organizations with just very poor password hygiene. Even just this morning, I was on the phone with a a dear client. I have a feeling I'm going to get to know this woman very well over the next few weeks, who admitted to me that she has been using the password kittens25 everywhere for the last decade. Now, not only is that a terrible password, but we all know that we should not be using the same or similar password everywhere all the time. But what I see both with individuals and with small and mid-sized businesses is that they are not enforcing strong password hygiene. And so we have this across the board, folks who are using that same or similar password. Now, people ask me all the time, well, Rachel, is the solution that we should be rotating our passwords all the time? And the answer, absolutely not. Now, so let me tell you why, and I'm gonna put you on the spot here. When you have been asked 
to rotate your password every 30 days, every 90 days, what do we all do? We all resort to a one-up sequence. Your password, kittens25, next month will be kittens26. The mm -hmm. month after that will be kittens27. By forcing our employees and our customers to rotate their passwords, we've actually driven the world to less secure passwords. So we don't recommend that anymore. And this is true, like at the highest levels, password rotation, big thumbs down. Instead, we want to insist on strong, lengthy, alphanumerically random passwords. And this is why, Tanisha, I'm a big fan of password manager apps. We're going to talk more about these in Austin. Like I strongly believe that whether it's personally or for your business, leveraging a passwordless solution or uh, leveraging a, a password manager that actually creates lengthy, random alphanumeric passwords for you, much safer way of doing the business with the internet. Between us, the most, the thing I love most about these password manager apps is the way they store your passwords that cryptographically sound passwords all of that much safer than how many of us are storing our passwords today that notes file on your phone that word document or excel file on your mm -hmm. computer maybe my least favorite that post-it note under the <laughs> did it. Yeah. not good places to be storing our passwords we want to leverage that government-grade encryption that these password manager apps give us. Again, much safer way of doing business with the internet. That's awesome. Yeah, and so I see a thumbs up already in the chat about the password manager apps for both personal and in the workplace. So thank you so much for that. That is a really key um, strategy to implement across the board. I see another question in the chat is, how do you convince leaders of investing more in cyber awareness in the workplace? So this is such a wonderful question, and I'm glad we're talking about this. So, you know, if you went back in time, you know, CISOs of the past, they used to come into their boards of directors, Tanisha, and they would tell these stories of myth and legend. It was very smoke and mirrors and bombast and terror and like, oh, all these groups are coming and it's going to be the end of the world. Boards got very numb to that kind of bombastic chatter. What I find now is that when I'm trying to convince my leadership that they want to invest more in cybersecurity, it's explaining to them that there are simple things we can do at reasonable cost that will measurably and demonstrably reduce our cyber risk. And I think especially for our audience in Austin, that's what we want to talk through if we view every cyber risk as equal, if we try to protect all of our data to the same standard, that means we're lowest common denominator. And that's not the right answer. We want a nuanced approach where we as firms decide what are our crown jewels? What must we protect at all costs? Let's do our best around those crown jewels and let's recognize that we need multiple layers of defense around those. It's all about presenting a nuanced strategy, a risk-based strategy, and having real measurable metrics where we can show that reduction in cyber risk pound over pound, quarter over quarter. It can't be just the girl who cries wolf every quarter. Sure. Sure. Yes, the numbers numbers tell a story in so many different ways. And when you're keeping track of those numbers in the form of metrics, then you're telling the story of success and what is worth for your team and your organization. So that's really sound. And I appreciate that as well. Similar to since we're staying on passwords a little bit, um, looks like Jadeep asked the question, what's your view about password less access? We talked a lot about having a password manager but password less access. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, I can tell you, Jaideep is, a, is, is after my own heart, reading my mind. Yes, that's certainly where we want to go. For example, Tanisha, like if someone is logging into my online portal, 
I am now looking at 40 different parameters associated with that login. Password is one of those 40 parameters, and it's not even in my top 10. I am working with the assumption that my employees and my customers are all using Kittens 25 everywhere all the time. I am working with the assumption that they are using terrible passwords. And I'm looking at all of the other aspects of that login, of that session, to validate that that, that, that person is truly who they say they are. This, of course, is where multi-factor authentication is the name of the game for mm -hmm. all of us joining in Austin. We're going to talk about this at length, that we never want to be relying on simply a username and password to validate our employees or to validate our customers. Irrespective of our industry, that's no longer an acceptable standards. And all of us, our regulators, would agree. We need to move to a model where we're multi-factor across the board and passwordless access gets us a very long way along those lines. Uh, I am excited for Austin because as we discussed yesterday, Tanisha, like you guys are my tribe, right? We're going to commiserate. We're going to bond. We are going to be in this space together. Yes, I do. Like we discussed yesterday and earlier today, not only we are tribe, but we're going to bond over the facts and the metrics, but we're also going to bond over some good food. Um, so thanks. <laughs> I can't yeah. wait. Yes, exactly. And I see um, Paul is back. So, Paul, you're here. We've had a great discussion. We're having a good time sharing some key stats and facts and things that we should know to get ready for GRC in Austin. What's that? I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm turning it back over to you. Well, thank you, Tanisha and Rachel. I, that was a very insightful conversation, and it only piqued my interest in attending the opening session. I will be there. I'm not sure I want my sleep disrupted, but it is what it is, right? It's <laughs> Thanks so much. And thank you to all that attended this session. I encourage you to go to the link uh, in the chat to um, register for this upcoming conference, which will be in Austin, Texas in August. And as I said before, Rachel is one of our keynote speakers. Uh, and thank you so much for your time. This concludes our uh, LinkedIn Live, we will have more to come, so look out for them. Thank you, ladies. Thank you.